Whenever a dead body has been discovered, the first thing they do is call in a forensic team to find the cause and the time of death. And forensics tell us that a dead body will take on the temperature of its environment where it's lying. And such was the case with the church at Laodicea. It was a room temperature church, neither hot nor cold. Laodicea was a church that allowed itself to be influenced by the world around it, with the result that it no longer influenced its environment, but was rather being influenced by its environment. And Jesus had nothing good to say about it. This church was ineffective. It was dead. The Laodicean church speaks of the worldly church. And Laodicea is a compound word from Laos, the Greek for people, and Dike, the Greek word for rule. These words mean mob rule. It's also a compound Greek word meaning almost the same thing as democracy. In other words, these people took democracy into the church government. But the church structure should be run by theocracy and not democracy. And whenever you have democracy within church government, you're always going to have worldliness. If there are problems within the church, then the word of God gives us the directions and the answers for overcoming the problems. The problem that King David had when he tried to get the ark of God's presence back to the people of, of Israel was that the glory had departed and he tried to get the ark and the glory back to God's people. And what he did was he did this by consulting all the people and it failed. It was only when he consulted God that he found the correct way to restore the ark. And anything done in God's way, which is according to his word, will never lack God's blessing. Democracy is not what God set in order for people to rule by. Theocracy is God-ordained rule, whereas democracy is mob-ordained rule. The church in Laodicea, they had locked Jesus outside, yet they were going through all their religious services. They had locked him outside the door of their hearts, and the invitation from him was to come and sit down at his table and share his meal. And the message from the king sitting at the table is to eat with him. But if you put ambition at the head of the table, or anything else, even your own ministry, anything that puts Christ second place, then he will not sit down and eat with you. He can't just be a byproduct of your life. You either love him with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength and all your heart, or you don't. It's as simple as that. You can't serve two masters. Just fitting the Lord into your schedule, an hour here or an hour there, that's what keeps him standing outside the door of our hearts. Because it's only while I'm seated at the table of the Lord that I find rest for my soul. And understanding comes when we eat at the table of the Lord. And you can't have rest for your soul until you've come to understand the ways of God. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So how do I find rest through all the trials and the tribulations of life that I go through? Well, I have to sit down and eat with him then I come to know his ways and understand his heart. His word becomes flesh because it's a living word and something that is alive 
and active can do something to you, it can bring you alive as well. There's a vast difference between knowing the scriptures and understanding the scriptures. Knowing knowledge is in our head. Understanding knowledge is in our heart. It is the experiential knowledge that causes our hearts to burn within. And I know the crisis of the Deliverer because I have experienced his deliverance in my life. Sitting and eating at the King's table is to get the experience. If I were to invite you to a meal in my house, you come in, you find a note on the table that says, please sit down, help yourself to the meal. Very sorry, but I can't join you as I just had to go to a meeting. Now you could enjoy that meal, but you would not have experienced my presence. And that's like some of us with the word of God. You sit down, we read the scriptures, but we know nothing about the author. We should know the Holy Spirit more than the scriptures. We should know the person more than we know their letters. And just because I know the scriptures, it doesn't say or imply that I know the Holy Spirit. I could have a degree in theology, but theology without experience is invalid. Otherwise, it's not worth tuppence. Knowing about a person is one thing, but knowing them personally is something else. It's just not enough for us to stand up and recite the creed, because scripture tells us that even the devils believe in God. If we haven't experienced his presence, then all we have is head knowledge. And that's why most people have no joy in their lives. Because in his presence, there's fullness of joy. A dead church is a church that has a form of religion, but has no power within it. And to the modern Laodicean church of today, what a person believes about basic biblical doctrines regarding Jesus, salvation, the Holy Spirit, or eternity. See, these are not important as long as everybody gets along with each other and everybody loves everybody else. They seem to forget that Jesus once said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So Jesus does in fact divide people. In fact, he's the greatest divider the world has ever known. And very seldom, if ever, do you hear any priest or preacher expound doctrinal texts of things that relate to divorce, morality, love of money or hell. These topics are hardly ever mentioned. And the reason that they're avoided is because they divide people, hurt their feelings. See, the talk today is let us respect, and tolerate each other, let us respect each other's culture, let us have religious tolerance, don't say anything that would offend somebody else's tradition, let's all give out a positive self image. The psychology of sin, from a modern perspective, is to make people feel better about themselves. You're okay the way you are. You don't have to change. You're just fine. Yeah, they're on. And the apostate church of Revelation 17 will be a very inclusive and ecumenical church. It will accept just about anyone as a member, as long as biblical truth is not part of their belief system. Even then their mantra will be doctrine divides and love unites. See, the difference between a dead church and a living church 
is the same difference between vultures and eagles. Vultures feed on dead meat, whereas eagles feed on meat that is alive. It would be very fitting to hear these words once again that Jesus addressed to this church. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, don't need anything. But you don't realise that you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. An ointment to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. And to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.